Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Bunn and I'll be walking you through my student grant project that I received through um, Save Barney Bay to document the settlement of Chrysora, Chesapeake, uh, which are <laughs> bay nettles um, on vital bulkheads in the Barney Bay. For those unfamiliar with the Barney Bay, it's the largest body of water in New Jersey. It has a mix of both fresh and salt water, which makes it an estuary. Because of its unique conditions, the bay is essential to many organisms and their development. The bay acts as a nursery for many organisms to grow. Each organism, big or small, contributes to the overall production in the bay. And this is just a photo of the, a map of the Barney Bay. Bay nettles are likely the most common jellyfish seen in the bay and have been around for thousands of years. They eat zooplankton, fish, and crab larvae, along with some other jellyfish, such as the comb jelly. We need bay nettles. They contribute to the bay's ecosystem, but high levels indicate poor water quality and their population is rising. And this photo is a small diagram of a bay nettle in the Medusa stage. Um, the top is called the bell, and they have long thick arms and small tentacles. The Medusa stage is the most common and easy to identify. In the top corner, you can see the shape is similar to the one um, in the previous slide with the bell and tentacles. When in the Medusa stage, males reduce, release sperm into the water. Eggs are held by a female, which catch the sperm and release the eggs. Once fertilized, the eggs grow into plan planula and are released from the, uh, from the female. Planulae drift freely until they find a surface to settle on and become polyps. Polyps can reproduce asexually through budding where they clone themselves. They become strobula, which create a stack of pancake-shaped clones. The pancakes break off into ephyrae, which will drift once again and become medusas. Polyps can preserve themselves in podocytes when conditions are not ideal for them, which would mean high water temperature or low food and they can stay and survive like that for years. And they can change it to polyp at any time. And the image at the bottom is a photo of podocytes from a study done on jellyfish polyps and podocytes. Pollution in the bay is caused mainly by stormwater runoff, leaking sewage and fertilizers all entering the bay leading to eutrophication. Eutrophication is when nitrogen and phosphorus begin to accumulate in the bay and cause an increase of phytoplankton and algae blooms. When the algae dies, it decays, which eats up all the dissolved oxygen, creating an anaerobic environment. Any organisms that relied on the oxygen to survive, such as fish, crab, and zooplankton, end up dying. While many organisms can't survive in anaerobic environments, bay nettles can. They're able to live and reproduce in water conditions that are not ideal for normal organisms. They don't need high salinity or much dissolved oxygen to survive. While bay nettles are usually positive additions to the environment, high bay nettle population throws off the populations of their prey, which further affects the ability for fish and crab populations to replenish. And this is just a photo of um, the food cycle. So where do bay nettles thrive? They um, lagoons are prime locations for bay nettles to thrive. They often have higher water temperature due to less water inflow. The water is often stagnant in several areas. If you look at the photo on the top right, you can see there is only one official entrance to the lagoon right around this area. The areas all the way in the back are going to have little to no new water. Another reason lagoons are great for bay nettle settlement is the abundance of substrates for them to attach to. Vinyl bulkheads are becoming more and more popular for water from homeowners due to their longevity. Many people also own plastic docks and jet ski, slips, jet ski slips. Vinyl and plastic are ideal for a bay nettle settlement for a couple of reasons. One reason being that wood bulkheads are often treated with toxic chemicals that deter settlement from almost any organism. Another being competition rate is low because the smooth surface is hard for other organisms to settle on. This photo at the bottom is what a typical vinyl bulkhead would look like. So my research, my research objectives were to determine whether or not polyps are present in the bay, um, compare water quality data and the correlation between polyp growth, and determine whether or not removing bay nettle polyps from bulkheads is beneficial. 
And this image down here shows where I did my research in the three locations. My methods, um, I conducted research once a week from June 20th to August 8th. I chose three locations in the Berkeley Shores Lagoon, Fayetteville, New Jersey. I chose these locations because of their access points. So if you can see the, these three photos, um, they don't have houses in front of them and they just have easy access to them. This is a closer up map of where each location is. I collected water quality data at each location prior to sampling. Um, I collected water temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen using a YSI multimeter, which is this um, in the bottom right. I also took note of the air temperatures and any bay metals that I could see. And this chart is an example of um, what I used, including some of my data that I did use also. I chose six sections of a bulkhead. For example, in the top right corner, I have four sections on a bulkhead separated. I used a paint marker to mark each number like I did in the photo. Five of those six sections were photographed, scraped, scrubbed with a handheld scrub brush, like you can see down in the right-hand corner of the scrub brush right here. And then um, I photographed them again. Um, you can see that also the other materials, such as the scraper um, and my mask, and this piece of wood that I used to measure the distance away for taking the photograph. Um, section six wasn't scrubbed, only photographed on the first and last day of research. The chart demonstrates each section and when it was scrubbed. Section one was scrubbed once a week, two was twice a week, three was three times, four was four times, five was five times, and six was not scrubbed at all. So my results, um, these charts are from the YSI water quality data collected prior to each sampling, um, such as shown in the chart two slides ago. Um, first is the average dissolved oxygen and water temperature at each location. Location A, which is number one on the chart, has good water temperature to dissolve oxygen re uh, relationship. Location B, which is two on the chart, has higher water temperature to, dissol to dissolve oxygen. This might mean that the location has had, had less water flow. Location C, which is number three on the chart, had both high temperature and high dissolved oxygen. This could either be due to human error or poor water conditions. Um, location C is surrounded by houses. Um, while location A and B have some wetlands nearby, so that could also contribute to the quality of the water. A and B might have less pollution. The next chart shows the average salinity. For location A, which is number one, um, salinity is high, likely high because it's close proximity to the opening of the bay. Location B had lower salinity. This might be due to some freshwater inflow coming in from nearby. And location B also had the clearest water despite it being the farthest from the opening of the bay. So that, it, that might mean that there's water coming from somewhere else when potentially the proximity, the wetlands across the street. Location C had high salinity, which also could be due to the proximity to the opening or the water temperature because um, higher water temperature means higher salinity. Um, location C was the most stagnant out of the three locations. So um, the water temperature was higher. Um, the line graph on the right takes the dissolved oxygen, water temperature, and salinity data from every sampling and puts it together. You can see the spikes in the dissolved oxygen, which is the gray line here. Um, it shows that there's drastic changes between the three locations. Salinity is the orange line, and it seems to be pretty stable, um, which is that even though it looks like a drastic change in the bar graph right over here, it's not really a lot. Um, I guess for water temperature too, there are some changes, but it's definitely not as drastic as the dissolved oxygen. The next chart um, on the left shows the correlation between water temperature and dissolved oxygen. Um, since water temperature should be going down as dissolved oxygen goes up, the trend in this chart doesn't correlate correctly. This is mostly because um, location sees dissolved oxygen levels. And the next chart is the amount of bayonetals I saw at each location. Location B had the most sightings throughout the whole season. There was an increase as the season went on, but and there were more sightings at the other two locations. There was most likely more bay than observed. Um, turbidity was 
high, so that means I couldn't really see um, very far ahead unless they were right in front of me or if they were right at the surface. So these are some of the photos that I took. Um, they were some of the best quality photos and they were all at location B. Um, the things in red are what I would assume to be polyps. I'm not completely sure. So I am kind of just saying that I think they are. Um, the first photo is from the second week and the second photo is the sixth week and the third photo was the, photo was the seventh week. At first, I wasn't sure if there would be any or if the ones on there actually were polyps, but after seeing the top of the third photo up here, um, the spots, the white spots were still there after being scrubbed um, up here. So I kind of just assumed that they might be polyps. Um, I did compare them to photos of real polyps, but the water quality isn't good enough in these photos to be able to get a definite answer. Um, one thing that is mildly concerning about scrubbing the bulkheads is shown in the first photo. And this section had already been scrubbed the week before, and there's a lot of polyps, potential polyps on here. So it might be possible that scrubbing the bulkheads is making room for more polyps to settle on. The last two photos were taken on the first and last week of sampling. They're both section six at the same location, which is location B. I'm not sure if the objects circled on the left are polyps or not, but if they are, there are considerably, there are considerably less of them in the photo on the right. Um, the photos and the ones before these might suggest that removing the competition from the bulkhead, which is like the other allergy and the barnacles and more, opens up more space for polyps to settle. Um, in conclusion, there's definitely bay nettle growth, growth in the Barnegat Bay. Removing polyps will most likely reduce the population, but doing further research will be beneficial. Luckily, the dive team and I are part of, that I'm a part of, um, they helped me with this project and they're in conjunction with Save Marnie Bay. We have a grant to clean people's bulkheads, so I will be continuing this research on a long-term but smaller scale. And if you would like more information or if you wanna see the photos that I took for each sampling, you can go to the website that I made um, by scanning the QR code or going to this link. And I would like to thank St. Barney of Bay and its student grant program for funding me in the study. Um, I'd also like to thank Gracie and Taylor um, from St. Barney of Bay, Greg Elliott, Chief of Berkeley Township Underwater Search and Rescue for their mentorship. Additionally, thank you to doc Dr. John Wenick, Mates, and Dr. John, Dr. Paul Blomina um, from Montclair for your technical advice on the project. And these are my references. Yeah, that's it. Nice work. I'm excited <laughs> to see all of this in the written report that folks who are watching can find on Save Barnegat Bay's website, www.savebarnegatbay.org. Uh, if you click on the word educate and then scroll down and click on the student grant tile, uh, you'll find reports from years prior as well as Lauren's report up there as well and other uh, students' reports there um, from the, this whole year and all the studies that uh, went on this year. Um, so I just have a question for you about, you know, it was hard to identify the polyps and we knew that going into this project, that it was gonna be hard to see um, whether or not a thing in a photo was what we thought it was. Um, so being that it was hard to identify the polyps, were you able to make any, even if anecdotal, observations about the other types of things you saw settling there? So like in places where the dissolved oxygen was higher, did you see more diverse organisms or where the salinity was maybe slightly different? Did you see consistently certain kinds of organisms? Were you able to kind of make any of that out or was it not a long enough time to see anything else settling since you scrubbed? Um. On, at location C, I did see some different types of algae. I don't know if it's just because of the lower amount of water flow that things were, left, were able to settle there more easily, but there definitely was different types of algae that are settling there. It just was more apparent in the photos that I took. 
Um, but other than that, not really, even with the location B, since the water was so clear, um, it only sometimes there would be more growth for each week. So it's just kind of not really correlated to um, how many times I scrub it, I don't think. It's a really interesting problem because it's a short amount of time, right? And so you're disturbing everything. And so it's really hard to see in such a short period of time what the true effects of scrubbing are. So I think it's, if, as we refine this project, we think um, you're gonna be, uh, we'll be able to guide you into finding out more concrete things about what's actually where and why basically. Yeah. Um, so for those of you watching, thank you so much for watching. Um, you can find the rest of the student grant presentations here on YouTube under our student grant presentation um, playlist. And uh, stay in touch with us as this project continues. You can find more information about the sea nettle management uh, project at savebarnegatebay.org as well. Um, if you click on the word educate, and instead of clicking on student grant, you can click on the sea nettle tile um, and you'll see all of the details about this grant and project. Um, if you're looking to get involved in your neighborhood, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll be scrubbing bulkheads in uh, Berkeley Township as well as Brick Township and Toms River over the next two and a half years. Uh, the scrubbing takes place in the winter time when uh, the jellyfish are most likely uh, dormant in those cold water seasons. If you don't have a bulkhead um, and you still want to stay in touch with the project about education and keeping pollution out of Barnegat Bay, definitely um, we need to take care of those issues as well in order to reduce the uh, pollution in Barnegat Bay that's encouraging the nettle population. And finally, if you're interested in seeing what's settling on your bulkhead, you can uh, get a set of settling plates, which are basically these little blue um, plates of plastic, which you can um, hang off of a little tiny piece of fishing line off of your um, uh, pilings, off your bulkhead and see, you know, you're able to pull the, the fishing line out of the water basically and see what's on these little plates. Um, and we just recently had an observation day where we invited everyone in the region to bring their settling plates back and look at them under a microscope. The Dr. Paul Bologna was there. Um, Greg, the chief of the dive team was there and Lauren and other students who worked in the sea nettle um, project were also there and everyone got to meet each other and also get to see what was on their plates. And it was really cool. We got to see some jellyfish polyps and a fira under a microscope, which I thought was pretty fantastic. So uh, we'll be uploading some of those videos here on YouTube as well. Um, I think that's everything. So thank you so much, Lauren, for your project. And uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.